Ever seen this folder before? If you've worked in an office, or seen a movie set in one, the answer is almost definitely yes. It is quite literally everywhere, a more ubiquitous and enduring piece of office stationery you would struggle to find. Whenever a set designer needs to communicate in an office environment, you are almost guaranteed to see the manila folder. In Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Catch Me If You Can, Zodiac, Naked Gun, The Death of Stalin, manila folders everywhere. It even pops up outside of the office. A dossier for a secret mission, manila folder. A bribe for a federal agent, manila folder. A classified briefing for the president, manila folder. Even on your desktop, manila folder. The list goes on and on. But why? Why this folder? Why is the beige colour so common? Why is there no other folder that holds such prominence in the cultural sphere? Well, the story for its prominence starts here, in the southern Philippines, and it has something to do with imperialism, trade, bureaucracy, and a plant called abaca. The manila folder's roots are traced back to the abaca plant, from which it is originally made. These plants grow in the southern region of the Philippines and the northern expanses of Borneo. They require an extensive wet season, yet simultaneously do not fare well in severe winds and thus are unable to grow in much of the surrounding area, as they are subject to severe typhoons. The plant's fibres are waterproof. They suffer little degradation when subjected to salt water, and as such the plant was originally used to fashion fishing nets and sacks. This made it a valuable commodity for sailors and merchants who hoped to keep their shipping logs and various other documents on board their ships intact. The first uses of abaca in paper were between the 1820s and 1830s, when mariners from Salem and Boston used it as a substitute for cotton and linen-based papers and ropes, due to shortages in those materials. It became a popular alternative, and by 1840 it had, quote, taken off in Occidental shipping circles, and presumably acquired its namesake, Manila Hemp, by association and proximity to the Philippine capital, Manila. For this reason, when the Philippines was a Spanish colony, the Crown of Spain set up joint ventures in the 19th century with European and American companies. These were to produce abaca and have them shipped off to various corners of the world to be used in a burgeoning international trade industry and bureaucracy. But it did eventually leave merchant circles first coming to prominence in the US Civil War between 1861 and 1865, where shortages of fibrous material, cotton for example, of which production was concentrated in the Confederacy, forced the Northern Union side to convert ropes made from abaca fiber into paper instead. This according to the historian J.E. Spencer is where the term manila folder originated from. From the 19th century onwards, manila paper would come to dominate the US bureaucratic economy. Even more so when the United States seized the Philippine colony from Spain and made it her own in the Spanish-American War of 1898. Under US overlordship, a monopolization program came into effect. It attempted to stamp out individual handicraft industries and substitute them with larger American corporations. This increased output, but it also meant that local populations became increasingly deprived of their livelihoods and craft. It also had the effect of making manila hemp the go-to fiber for paper within the United States, as the monopoly meant import prices and availability were favorable. 
The extent of this is made clear by import statistics. In 1941, while the Philippines was still a US colony, and prior to the Japanese invasion as part of their campaign in World War II, the United States imported 98% of its abaca fibre from the Philippines. It was the metaphorical jewel in its paper crown. US imports of abaca fibre were so extensive that they counted for nearly 60% of all the Philippine exports of the material, which meant the rest of the world was essentially scrounging for scraps. The Philippines already had a quasi-monopoly on abaca production prior to US involvement, with other production hubs in the Dutch East Indies and later Central America producing fractions of their output. This essentially meant the United States had monopolized a monopoly, a very lucrative position to be in. So, quick summary, Manila hemp is made from the abaca plant. It was picked up by sailors and merchants since it was nice and durable, and then, as the 19th century marched onwards, it gradually adopted its place as a tool of bureaucracy. Finally, when the United States imprinted itself on the Philippines, it siphoned much of the world's supply of manila hemp for cheap and abundant use in the United States which I theorise is why it became so ubiquitous in American offices and subsequently American media. And then, that media was exported abroad to other English-speaking and Western nations, where the Manila folder became not just a domestic, but international icon. The cultural clout of the Manila folder is so significant that even today, folders and paper are styled in the fashion of Manila hemp even though the materials used are vastly different. That beige style has a grip of familiarity on the cultural consciousness, and it shows in everyday media. While it mostly flies under the radar, the Manila folder is the go-to container for documentation. It is a product of its incredible history.